for joining. Um, let's see if I can get this PowerPoint going here. Right. So the uh, title of my talk is uh, <clears throat> Why God Talks Back, Valuing Persons and Depending on God in Pentecostal Congregations in Buffalo, New York. And uh, the, the talk is drawing from this uh, book that's uh, forthcoming next year from Lewisbury called A Pentecostal Insight in a Segregated U.S. City, Designs for Vitality. Um, the text is, uh, incorporates uh, commentaries on my ethnography by a couple of graduate students, Lashikia Chatman and Michael Richbart, who have also, been, uh, also done work and been involved in Pentecostal congregations in, uh, in Buffalo, along with the uh, conversations that I have with them about the ethnography and about their commentaries. Um, so I think what I'll try to do is just to read off the screen here um, and uh, just sort of switch back to the PowerPoints when I need to. Okay, so the, the book uh, compares the kinds of knowledge that Pentecostal believers receive from God about their own and other people's lived circumstances in one majority white and two African-American congregations in Buffalo, New York, knowledge that believers call discernment. For North American Pentecostal and charismatic Christians generally, discernment is a sign of mature faith since it involves proper understanding of scripture or a prophetic ability to hear and convey God's word. To quote, have discernment is to be attentive to the divine voice, which believers may apprehend as an audible utterance, or more commonly as a thought which is not their own. Most importantly, discernment is essential to vitality, by which I mean both human flourishing and eternal life in heaven. Because having a relationship with God consists of knowing how to invite God to inhabit one's body and to how to repel the devil's desire to do so. In the book, I refer to discernment as Pentecostal insight as a way of highlighting its critical dimensions. Communications from God matter to Pentecostal believers because they entail critical claims that people should pass beyond what are considered ordinary forms of perception, feeling, movement, and comprehension so that they may conform with God's intentions. Messages from God induce believers to question accustomed forms of interaction and knowledge and to create novel relationships and institutional arrangements in the process in ways that differ significantly among the three congregations I discuss. My central questions involve how Pentecostal insights are shaped by the ways life chances are distributed across multiple intersections of class, race, and gender, in a post-industrial, highly racially, highly racially segregated U.S. city, and conversely, how believers' life chances are affected by the ways they discern God's intents. So for those of you who uh, may not uh, be familiar with um, Buffalo, um, it is a city located about 400 miles from New York City on the Canadian border. Okay. Specifically, I argue that believers take God's designs for vitality as a principal object of their discernment. One of my overall claims in the book is that an important source of political sensibilities is to be found in intersections between the ethical, which has to do with evaluation, and the vital, which has to do with flourishing or affliction. In conceptualizing vitality, I'm introducing my own gloss on the Christian concept of life, articulated in the ubiquitous, ubiquitously quoted scripture, I have come that they may have life and that they might have it more abundantly. However, I differ from most Christians in that I do not refer to an individual's vital essence. I find the concept of vitality useful because it connotes but is not confined to human flourishing. As I understand it, a suffering body has vitality. Suffering and endurance are forms of vitality. The concept of vitality then refers in open-ended ways to a range of tensions and overlaps between flourishing and affliction. These tensions and overlaps provide avenues 
for conceptualizing how believers understand God's role in permitting or even designing suffering and for grasping their thinking about its unequal distribution. The key reason then for taking a comparative approach to Pentecostalism, indeed for exploring Pentecostalism at all, is to ask how different ways of developing insight into the sources and nature of vitality may provide grounds for divergent ethical and political visions. Uh, oops, let me get back to the slide here. So here are the uh, list of the churches that I've, I've been uh, working with. I make this case in the book by comparing how members of a majority white church that I call Eternal Hope and two African-American congregations that I call Victory Gospel and Heaven's Tabernacle understand God's designs for events, communication, care, placement in space, and personal value. And personal value is the topic of my talk today. Eternal Hope is a suburban majority white working class congregation of about 300 members affiliated with a national first wave Pentecostal denomination whose leader, Pastor Charles, encourages believers to achieve a good life by admitting their incapacities to God, receiving God's love, and extending that love as a gift to others. This outlook underpins a right-wing political stance that values people for their willingness to acknowledge their dependence upon God. And it's critical of what is taken to be elite secularist insistence on personal self-sufficiency. Many members of Eternal Hope were raised Catholic in Italian, German, or Polish neighborhoods and converted to Pentecostalism as the result of the proselytizing efforts of a married couple who founded the church in the 1970s. Congregants in Victory Gospel and Heaven's Tabernacle, smaller scale non-denominational African-American churches led by a male pastor and by a female pastor respectively, hope to receive blessings by involving themselves in God's system which they understand as subverting the exploitative world system. And as I point out in the, in the PowerPoint, uh, uh, Victory Gospel um, has about 50 members, Heaven's Tabernacle about 20 members. Heaven's Tabernacle is almost all female. Um, both of those churches were founded around 2010. Um, and the, uh, I should point out that the, the neighborhoods in which uh, those two churches are located are some of the poorest neighborhoods in the United States. Their approaches, the approaches that uh, Pastor John and Pastor Hadley take uh, combine critical stances toward racialized inequalities with prophetic worship styles that stress healing and prosperity. Uh, the leaders of Victory Gospel at Heaven's Tabernacle emphasize how a good life requires attention to the conditions under which they may receive and extend blessings by remaining obedient to God. I want to stress that these churches are all very similar to one another in matters of basic doctrine. All the committed believers whom I describe insist on the need to be born again, a condition signified by the Holy Spirit's gift of the ability to speak in tongues, as well as on the principle that God has established a moral order that is violated by individual sin, which in the absence of willingness to accept Jesus leads inevitably to eternal damnation. The churches are all emphatically heteronormative. Although these churches have nothing to do with each other, their members would undoubtedly recognize one another as fellow saved Christians. It's the fact of basic similarity that makes the differences of emphasis and social circumstance illuminating. Now, as many scholars have pointed out, notably Tanya Lerman in her book, When God Talks Back, practices of discernment are important means by which God becomes real for believers. Yet, in focusing on the reasons why believers discern God's designs for vitality, I ask instead why exactly the existence of God matters to them in the first place. In keeping with my concern with political sensibilities, my focus here is on how believers' sense of personal value and capacity is shaped by the kinds of discernment that God both provides them and enjoins them to develop. This approach asks me, this, this approach leads me to ask why God talks back in specific and varying ways. For example, in the suburban church of eternal hope, there is a time set aside at the end of a service 
when members come forward to ask for God's help and others in the congregation intercede, that's their term for them, by praying and laying hands on them in groups. At these times, intercessors whisper in the ears of supplicants, encouraging them to place their problems in the hands of the Lord. Quote, this is between you and Jesus. Whatever it is, just talk to him, ask him to help you, and he will. He will give you that strength and that wisdom, and he will teach you his ways. At these times, God, who motivates intercessors to speak, reminds believers at eternal hope of their intrinsic incapacities and their need to rely on him for guidance. By contrast, Pastor John and Pastor Hadley commonly preach to members of Victory Gospel at Heaven's Tabernacle, many of whom live in precarious circumstances, that, quote, the reason you're going through problems is that you keep falling for the same tricks of the devil. And it's like a revolving door. The same things are coming up on you over and over again. In these African-American churches, when God talks back, he often really talks back, reminding believers sharply of things they have done and said. When they are going through problems, that's their term, going through, believers at Victory Gospel and Heaven's Tabernacle feel they must evaluate how they ask God and other people for help. To make requests in the wrong way is often taken to signal moral failure, and indeed may be seen to account for the fact that a person is going through problems in the first place. For example, Pastor Hadley recounted how a prayer partner named Emily related how she would ask God for help during emergencies by demanding, God, you got to come through. And Emily heard God reply dismissively, oh, that's just Emily. She tells me what to do. So in all these churches, God wants people to discern that their vitality in this world and the next hinges on how they acknowledge their dependence upon him. Yet the meanings of depending on God hinge on what dependence signifies within believers' divergent lived situations. This point may be made clear by considering the kinds of false knowledge that the devil is seen to provide. As the antithesis of God, the devil is both a destroyer and even more fundamentally a deceiver. According to members of the suburban church of eternal hope, the devil wants people to imagine that they are complete in themselves, whereas God wants us to discern the whole in ourselves that only he can fill. So we have to open ourselves out. They rely on lots of images of opening. Members of the African-American churches, by contrast, are concerned with problems of respect in a context where black people are subject to much disrespect. Pastor Hadley and Pastor John make clear to believers that relations of respect are key to their life chances, both in this world and the afterlife, arguing that the devil desires them to demand respect on the wrong terms. Pursuing this comparative line of inquiry, I focus on how discernment constitutes what Michael Jackson calls knowledge of the body. In ideal terms, discernment becomes what the body knows and how the body knows. Members of eternal hope foster ways of becoming open to God by admitting their lack of self-sufficiency. Some of them relate how experiences of divine love are contingent on distinguishing between affirmative and self-belittling ways of asking God for help, a distinction they link to their conversion from Catholicism. For Pastor John and Pastor Hadley, by contrast, it is less important to admit that one is incapable of getting by through one's own energies. Than that, one, that, than that one should not get by in a manner contrary to God's will. As people accustomed to the informal economies of the street, members of Victory Gospel at Heaven's Tabernacle know that they can make do, but can they do so in obedience to God? Whereas members of the suburban church focus on imagery of openness, Pastor John and Pastor Hadley deploy idioms of bodily receiving. Pastor Hadley and Pastor John make clear that to receive from the prophet of God is to respect both the prophet and God. In becoming respectfully obedient to God, you learn to respect yourself because you come to see yourself as God sees you, not as degraded, but as prosperous and healthy. By contrast, propensities to retaliate over perceived insults originates from willingness to receive the devil's false communications through one's eye gates and ear gates, 
in other words, from misplaced respect from the devil. For all these believers, then, discernment involves ways of inhabiting the body that foster critical understandings of personal value and thus distinctive political sensibilities. And to illustrate these points ethnographically, I turn first to the ways members of the suburban Church of Eternal Hope explain the significance of prayer. Over the many years that a middle-aged man I call Benny has attended Eternal Hope, he has gotten to know much about the life circumstances of other members. Many, he told me, had suffered from drug and alcohol addictions and had seen their finances and jobs ruined. God brought them to a point in their life when they said, when they said, everything I've tried doesn't work. Help me, God, help me. Benny spoke of recognizing one's own incapacity and consequent willingness to ask God for help as a key precondition for faith. Once people understand that they must depend on God rather than on their own abilities, and that God's love will assist them as they go through troubles, that's his term, they will be able to extend God's love to others whom they will help bring through difficulties, again, Benny's term, by witnessing, praying, and interceding. Benny and his wife, Janet, contrasted this approach to asking and thanking God to the Catholic practices familiar to them from their youth. Both of them had been staunch Catholics until soon after their marriage, when they responded to the door-to-door -door proselytizing of a minister affiliated with Eternal Hope. Janet recalled being told during her childhood that, quote, when you're sick, you pray to St. Jude, but she was never taught that she could, quote, pray through her troubles to get back to the place where you should be in God. As a young couple, they both felt that they knew of God as one would a celebrity, but wanted to know him personally, and therefore prayed together for deeper knowledge. When they first came to eternal hope, Janet seized Benny by the arm and took him to the altar where a group was praying for the sick. They laid hands on the couple and quote, brought us through, had us talking in tongues. Benny found that he could quote, get to know God as a friend. When you pray to him, he will use other people to speak to you. Benny's and Janet's novel insights into who God is caused a shift in the texture of their dependencies on both God and their families. Their parents were all upset by their departure from Catholicism. Benny went so far as to call it a disowning. His parents felt it was like a personal slap in the face. Yet over time, Benny's and Janet's parents came to respect their commitment to God. When a cousin, a woman in her 30s, contracted breast cancer, Janet's mother called them to pray for her. They know that we're praying people, Janet said. We'll really pray, not just say it. They rely on us for a lot of things in general, rides and everything else. Janet and Benny spoke of praying to God on behalf of their families as an important form of caring, comparable to such acts of giving as providing rides, cooking, and cleaning for aging parents. Everyone understands the efficacy of such prayers as contingent upon believers' personal relationships with God, connections predicated on specific linguistic forms associated with prayer. I often heard in eternal hope, though not in the African-American churches, that every person is born with a hole open inside himself or herself that the devil will try to fill with destructive thoughts and behaviors. Arlene, another member of the eternal hope, told me that after she first spoke in tongues, she realized that when she had previously thought about her body over the course of an unsatisfactory marriage, she had envisioned herself with a large black hole over her torso. Once she got a relationship with God, she envisioned her body as complete. The devil, she told me, wants us to imagine that we're complete in ourselves, whereas the Holy Ghost gives us the insight that Jesus must fill the hole in us that had been opened. This imagery of false versus true self-completion represents a particular stance on the Pauline predicament broadly shared in all the churches I'm discussing. Not to quote from Romans 7, for I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Arlene distinguished Pentecostal prayer from the styles of speaking to God that she adopted during her Catholic youth. During the early years of her marriage, Arlene found herself wondering, quote, who she was, puzzling over the fact that other people seemed confident about their directions in life. In retrospect, she realizes that she was searching for God, not for herself. She came to understand this point as a result of attending a Pentecostal church where another woman convinced her of the scriptural necessity of getting the Holy Ghost. 
Nonetheless, she recalled, at the time, I was still doing a lot of things Catholic in the way I prayed or in the way I talked to God. In the Catholic realm, you're always begging God. Arlene narrated a move away from what she perceived as pleading with God, the form of self-abnegation toward a more informal style of asking. For Arlene and other Eternal Hope members, quote, just being able to go and ask God on an informal basis is a principal avenue to the experience of divine love because this form of asking promotes a companionate relationship with God that may be likened to marriage. Believers depict speech to God as a conduit of understanding and communication with other people, so that having a relationship with God remakes the qualities of their dependence on others. Janet explained, quote, prayer really helps get you through troubles in marriage. It gets you back to the place where you should be in God, ready to forgive. Likewise for Arlene, the sense of companionship arising from her ability to ask things of God on an informal basis has enhanced her sense of personal worth, whereas the act of begging God as a Catholic made her feel that she was, quote, never good enough. Eternal Hope members' practices of asking reflect some culturally specific predicaments concerning care and self-sufficiency. I often ask them what difference it makes to say, I will pray for you while you're going through this trouble as opposed to, I really hope things will get better for you. I was commonly told that there was nothing wrong with expressing hope that a situation would improve, but that it was merely a polite comment. It's just a gesture. Praying for someone, on the other hand, elicits the hope of Jesus, help of Jesus for the other person. As such, it is a form of labor. Lynn, another member of Eternal Hope, referred me to the bestseller, The Power of a Praying Parent, by evangelical author Stormy Omartian, who casts the work of prayer as an acknowledgement of her own personal weakness and a request for strength and influence. Omartian frames the admission of personal incapacity as a condition of empowerment. I have a slide with a quote on it here. So I'll just read this aloud. The Bible says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven, Matthew 18, 18. God gives us authority on earth. When we take that authority, God releases power to us from heaven. Because it's God's power and not ours, we become the vessel through which his power flows. When we pray, we bring that power to bear upon everything we're praying about, and we allow the power of God to work through our powerlessness. When we pray, we are humbling ourselves before God and saying, I need your presence and your power, Lord. I can't do this without you. When we don't pray, it's like saying we have no need of anything outside of ourselves. Whenever you pray for your child, do it as if you're interceding for his or her life, because that is exactly what you are doing. Remember that while God has a perfect plan for our children's lives, Satan has a plan for them too. Satan's plan is to destroy them, and he will try to use any means possible to do so. Drugs, sex, alcohol, rebellion, accidents, disease. But he won't be able to successfully use any of those things if his power has been dissipated through prayer. So Amartian begins from a premise of personal incapacity. She does not assert that she possesses prior abilities and character traits that she can bestow as gifts upon her children or through a salaried career, a topic she does not discuss. Rather, Omartian casts herself as powerless in herself to refrain from the, repeating the mistakes made in her own upbringing. It is her willingness to ask God for help, together with the labor she devotes to doing so that she construes as empowering. To refuse to put in the work of asking God to protect her children would be to refuse to care. It would be tantamount in Marcel Moses' terms to rejecting one's obligations to give. Self-sufficiency, self nonetheless, is the metaphorical ground upon which the figure of prayer is inscribed in Omartian's account. Crucially, she characterizes the unsaved condition of not praying as saying we have no need of anything outside of ourselves. In other words, that we do not have to offer requests because we do not need to receive anything in return. In effect, people must be redeemed from a false sense that their security derives from their own efforts or intrinsic traits. By acknowledging their incapacity, they receive God's authority, which provides true security, 
In a similar vein, and here I'm quoting from a, a passage from uh, Kevin Roos's The Unlikely Disciple. Uh, Reverend Jerry Falwell Sr. remarked in a sermon to students at uh, Liberty University, which is a, a Baptist college, if I were to ask to, you to write down on a piece of paper your dream for the life that is ahead of you, I would get about 10,000 different answers. But then I would ask you, do you plan to do it out of your own energy and, and proficiency? Or do you plan to tap into the anointing of God's spirit? Like Lamartian, Falwell frames prayer as a counterpart to the ideology of individual achievement. The admission of helplessness is a means of assuring security and indeed a precondition for success. At the same time, Falwell and Omartian share a basic premise of white privilege, namely the ability to presume rather than explicitly state that security and success ought to be theirs in the nature of things. This outlook on admitting helplessness differs from that of many in what Elizabeth Currid Halcott labels the elite aspirational class in the US, whose consumption habits index exclusive status and knowledge, together with commitments to good causes. Those in the aspirational class are usually encouraged to feel, or at least behave in professional settings, as though they possessed intrinsic talents upon which to, upon which to draw to achieve success, even as their financial investments in real estate and higher education help to solidify barriers to upward mobility faced by, by the majority of the US population. In eternal hope, believers often disclaim the efficacy of inborn talents, for instance, by praying, I'm so sorry, God, for always trying to take control and do it my way. They combine these admissions with a readiness to labor in prayer on other people's behalf. As with other forms of labor, the extent to which the work of prayer is recognized and valued is a matter of politics. These labor politics of prayer provide powerful grounds for a right-wing critique of the exclusivity of the aspirational class. I find it no coincidence that, that the 2016 Republican Party platform states, however cynically, every time we sing God bless America, we are asking for help. We ask for divine help that our country can fulfill its promise. In a move lending itself to political revanchism, the notion that a person thrives by virtue of his or her innate talents is framed, not unreasonably, as arrogant. I regard this stance as a key basis for eternal hope preachers' condemnation of, quote, humanism as a conceited opinion that man is the measure of all things, for their denunciations of the corollary view that individuals may create standards that they consider appropriate about same-sex marriage, for instance, instead of adhering to the moral order established by God, and for their embrace of right-wing political figures. Yet arguments about the need to abide by God's moral order need not center on concerns about self-sufficiency. For members of the African-American churches, the significance of requests made of God hinges instead on problems of respect. Back to the earlier slide here. Living for God changes your priorities, Lynn remarked to me at Eternal Hope. You start to think more about salvation. I always tell my children that we are not just put on this earth to be born, make money, and die. Yes, you have to work, you have to pay your bills and all that, but really it's all about salvation. Well, I have no reason to think that Lynn was especially well off. Her comment conveyed a taken for grantedness about making money, together with a suspicion of its existential senselessness who's like I never heard at all among members of the African-American churches of Victory Gospel and Heaven's Tabernacle. Their outlooks have been shaped by the profound racial wealth gap in the United States, stemming from slavery and entrenched by systematic housing and school segregation. For them, much of the appeal of living for God is being, quote, sick and tired of being sick and tired. However, they do not understand personal incapacity as a problem to be overcome in the same ways as do members of eternal hope. For them, the need to depend on God derives in large part from the ambiguities of exploitation and dependence that often inform kinship relations among the urban poor. God will bless you emotionally, mentally, spiritually, physically, and financially, Pastor John often remarks. The devil will only bless you financially, and he'll only do that for a short while. 
for instance, via illegal drug sales. To be blessed by God, for Pastor John, is to be valued as a person in ways that transcend all other rubrics. God's blessings bestow favor in the eyes of men. That is, extraordinary forms of prosperity and advancement on the model of Joseph, who was imprisoned in Egypt, but subsequently elevated by Pharaoh to a position of power. Yet Pastor John's argument that the devil is a source of blessings, albeit false ones, suggests that for the urban poor, Christianity presents one set of approaches among others to questions of who should be depended on, on what terms, and with what implications. To a much greater extent than in eternal hope, the problem of which sources of vitality to draw upon is thematized in the African-American churches. As these believers gain insight into the ways God extends blessings, they learn particular ways to respect and be respected while ideally unlearning others. Pastor John routinely says as much when instructing his congregation that they should, quote, put nobody before God. He loves God first, then his wife, then his children, both in his household and in his church. If his wife were to tell him to go against God's instructions, he would not listen to her. Yet the connections between respect and dependence upon God are not simple. Following a public dispute on the phone and prayer line between two members of Victory Gospel, a senior woman named Mother Smith felt it necessary to deliver a speech at the conclusion of a Bible study session. We have some strong personalities in this church, she said. We have so little, and we want respect from other people, so we're always on the lookout to see who's going to aggravate us. During a Sunday service a few weeks later, Pastor John told everyone to turn to the person sitting next to him or her and say, neighbor, I'd rather have truth than be real. Perceiving his audience's confusion, he elaborated, we street people have got no problem being real. An eye for an eye is real, but turn the other cheek and vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay our truth. Mother Smith and Pastor John felt it necessary to carry out a careful parsing of respect. They argued that we street people ordinarily and wrongly demand respect in ways that contribute to emotionalism and violent tit-for-tat reprisals. Yet if we submit to God and obey his word conveyed by the pastor, we, we will receive such favor that even our adversaries will be compelled to respect us in accordance with the scripture Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Now, in order to foster proper kinds of respect, Pastor John and Pastor Hadley feel it necessary to remake a range of intercorporeal and spiritual connections and coverings, those are their idioms, that derive in part from kinship relations. Idioms of connection convey the permeability of the body to a range of beneficent and dangerous forces while covering involves forms of protection from spiritual and social dangers. Pastors deploy idioms of receiving to help believers discern how they have allowed God and the devil to connect them to or cover them with sources of vitality or destruction that are inherent in kinship. So this idiom of receiving connotes hearing as well as acceptance and consequent action. The semantics of receiving reflect the prominence in African-American language patterns of listener-oriented semiotic forms in which the significance of an utterance depends on the responses it, elic it elicits. At times during ordinary conversation when I would have been likely to ask, how did so-and-so respond to that advice? My friends in the African-American community would say, how did they receive that? At a certain revival, a preacher whom I did not know gave me a prophetic word. She asked me to stand in the midst of the congregation and publicly warned me, the devil is after your mind. I approached her afterwards to say, thank you for the word you gave me. She replied, thank you for receiving it, acknowledging my appreciation and in effect letting me know that it was my responsibility to act on the knowledge. Allowing the devil to shape one's thinking is likewise a matter of receiving or agreeing. A woman in Pastor Hadley's congregation remarked that when misfortunes or provocations occur, it is important to, quote, throw that demon into confusion by dancing or praising. The devil throws something at you and waits to see if you're in agreement. For these believers, the question, who have you received from, 
is closely linked to who do you respect. Pastor Hadley and Pastor John, as I said, make clear that to receive from the prophet of God is to respect both the prophet and God. For them, understanding who you are in God entails discerning how and from whom you have received a covering. This point became clear to me over the course of a series of weekly Bible studies conducted by Pastor Hadley on the, quote, spirit of rejection. The overall thrust of the lessons was that the spirit of rejection, quote, causes you to lose the identity that God desires for you so that you see yourself as a failure. Pastor Hadley attributed this problem to a range of deleterious influences to which people had been subjected in childhood. For instance, being told by their mothers that they would never amount to anything, which have given them false understandings of their capabilities. Most of us are not receiving God's promises because we are feeling rejected, said Pastor Hadley. As a spirit bestowed by more powerful others, rejection is in effect a harmful and distorting kind of covering. Pastor Hadley's role during this Bible study was not only to extend God's covering in the form of God's word, but to encourage members of her congregation to discern the consequences of their own respectful or disrespectful comportment. One woman named Tricia commented that, quote, faith takes work. It's all right to know that I'm feeling hurt as long as I get past that place. She recounted that she had had to deal with some insulting behavior the previous day. She had heard her children swearing on the porch, and when she told them to be quiet, her daughter responded defiantly, we groan. Trisha had shouted at them and threatened to expel her daughter from her house. Then, quote, I had to go into my room, lock my door, pray to God to help me. I went to pastor's house to talk with her and was there for hours in cousin and friend mode. The following morning, Trisha testified, her daughter asked her for her food stamp card to buy food for her own children. Trisha allowed her to spend the last $6 on the card, even though her daughter had a lot of money on her own card and it had been so disrespectfully nasty to her. Susan, another woman in the congregation, asked whether Trisha would have been wrong had she refused her daughter's request, since Trisha is a good person. Pastor Hadley corrected Susan sharply. The love in us will compel us to do right. Because you said Trisha is a good person, something is going to come up on you. Now you're going to have to go through a test. According to Pastor Hadley, Susan's errant speech amounted to disrespect for God's instructions to love. In effect, Susan's words had connected her with the devil, setting trouble in motion for herself. While Pastor Hadley is primarily concerned with relations of respect among women, or with how women relate to one another through men, Pastor John is more concerned with the difficulties faced by Black men. He identifies himself as part of a younger generation of believers who consider it important to preach about sexuality and gender relations. And he implies that earlier generations allowed problems to fester by refusing to speak publicly about how connections among bodies and spirits bear on these matters. Pastor John remarks that relationship problems are some of the most pressing issues church members are facing. He continually emphasizes how submitting to God provides a model for how a wife should respectfully submit to her husband. When she knows he is wrong about something, she should not strenuously argue, but instead pray to God, who will set him right if her husband has a relationship with him. Johnetta Cole and Beverly Guy Sheftal point out that struggles for gender equality in African-American communities are often complicated by the needs women commonly feel to compensate men for the oppression they endure, a dynamic that frequently leads women to avoid publicizing gender-based violence. Pastor John, however, attributes domestic difficulties within poor African-American families to improper socialization and ultimately to lack of respect for God. In Pastor John's view, state-initiated assaults on black men have been designed by the devil to take advantage of the ways bodies become connected to other beings. These assaults contribute to a wide range of pathological sexual connections that provide openings for demonic spirits to afflict both women and men. In other words, it is necessary to discern and be delivered from the harm people have received from these spirits in order to construct families based on love and respect. <clears throat> 
While Pastor John's approach is unapologetically patriarchal, it bears affinities to Bell Hooks's argument that, quote, often black male children hear adult women repeatedly maligning adult black males, saying things like, he's no good, he ain't shit, or there's not a black man on this earth you can count on. This dynamic, according to Hooks, contributes to hopelessness, a sense of powerlessness, and continual anger. Such destructive forces prompt believers to discern ways to receive from God in order to address problems of respect, problems that Pastor John and Pastor Hadley conceptualize and approach in divergent ways. So to conclude, an important reason God talks back to these believers is to intervene in ongoing negotiations over who and what is to be valued and in what fashions. Pentecostal believers take as a premise that God's designs for personal value, as for all else, are not the same as human ones. God talks to believers because he has to, quote, teach them his ways. Pastor Hadley compares God to a parent who feels compelled to run when a baby, that is a new convert, cries to him for help. He will move quickly to see what he must do. However, God will not treat a grown child, a believer mature enough to understand his will, with the same solicitousness. Sometimes when Pastor Hadley asks God for help, God replies simply, my grace is sufficient unto you, and leaves it at that. The question of what counts as a respectful interaction is central for Pastor Hadley in ways not shared by members of Eternal Hope, who concentrate on how to signal their, their incapacities to God and respond to those of others. The divergent critical bearings of these insights into value help to explain why God talks back to these believers in different ways. Eternal Hope members' ambitions to be valued for the work they devote to prayer and to admitting their own lack of self-sufficiency often make them receptive to right-wing political appeals. Members of Victory Gospel in Heaven's Tabernacle, laity as well as pastors, have comparable ambitions to be valued and respected as they pray for protection and blessings. Yet the politics involved are quite different because the reflections on the content and sources of personal value are dissimilar. A telling point has to do with the reasons why God speaks. Pastor John remarked to me that he had surprised a group of urban and suburban church leaders by telling them that the Holy Ghost is not necessarily comforting. Well, he is a comforter, yes, but you have to discipline yourself to allow the Holy Spirit to lead you to all truth. God is a God of order. If you get out of order, he may expose you. As Pastor John sees it, respectful obedience is the only means of counteracting the operations of the world's system, which extracts vitality from black bodies in order to promote distorted forms of respect and value. By contrast, members of eternal hope take self-sufficiency as a ground of adult personhood. In principle, as it were, one ought to be self-sufficient, but in fact cannot be, so that one's vitality depends on the help of the Holy Ghost. In becoming bodily extensions of God's love, believers at eternal hope calibrate their sense of dependence on him against their sense of autonomy. So to take the very broadest view here, in concentrating on how forms of openness and reception inherent in discernment constitute different kinds of knowledge of the body, I have been exploring how intersections between the ethical and the vital give rise to political sensibilities. In so doing, my work contributes to a growing literature on the ways religious and or secular approaches to the body help to enact forms of justice. As historian David Nirenberg points out, Christians who have identified freedom with transcendence of the body have for centuries cast Judaism as a foil, epitomizing overly fleshly and hence distorted forms of justice. Think of Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice. In this way, the Christian tradition of transcendence has repeatedly aimed to supersede the linkages made in the Old Testament between God's justice and bodily activities, such as food practices. Yet Christian models of divine justice themselves commonly rely on images of the body. We need look no further than depictions of Jesus as a hypermasculine John Wayne figure within Christian nationalist circles in the contemporary US. 
Further, a number of critical treatments of secularism, including John Bowen's and Mayanti Fernandez's work in France and Lucinda Ramberg's work in India, arguably indicate that such secularist ideals as privatized sex and transcendence of externally imposed forms of comportment have religious sources. These treatments all indicate how political sensibilities often derive from the nexus between the ethical and the vital, regardless of whether these domains are labeled religious. What I've tried to do in turn by focusing on Pentecostal believers' relationships with God is to explore how communicative relationships with human and spiritual others entail bodily forms of openness or receptivity, and in so doing, provide grounding for divergent political visions. Not only, in other words, is the question of how bodily dispositions are to be valued a political issue, but as Pentecostal believers readily point out, bodies do not exist in isolation. For them, developing knowledge of God's designs is vital because it is a socially embedded and embedding set of activities that lend themselves readily to disparate models for collective political arrangements. So that's what I got.